Welcome back. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about some ethics and also thinking about human interaction. So thank you everyone for um, watching the brief Tuskegee video that Charmaine sent out and uh, her presentation on research ethics. So Charmaine is the research, a research ethics board consultant and she had generously agreed to create this content for us because when I was going online, there, we're in this weird situation, right? Where we're, we're, a lot of us are computer scientists. We're not used to thinking about humans. Many computer scientists don't actually realize that if they work with humans, they need to do, they need to think about ethics um, and think about approval. On the other hand, the kind of training you need to do uh, in order to uh, perform medical experiments on humans is much more extensive probably than what we were looking for. So uh, she was nice enough to put together that brief video to kind of uh, get us thinking about that. So to kick things off, I would like you to go to the Poll Everywhere site. So remember this is pollev.com slash Matt Taylor with three T's. And I'm interested in, in the class, which of these had you heard of before? So we, we learned about the Tuskegee study um, in, in the YouTube video, but I'm curious how many people had heard about that before the study, or, sorry, before they watched that YouTube video, and also these others. So, <coughs> um, and one of the reasons I ask about this is because it's, if you don't have, uh, if you've ever taken a psych course, it's possible that you've never heard of this, but also I think of the Tuskegee study as being pretty common knowledge in the U.S., and I'm not sure if that's true outside of the US. So I was really interested to see, because, because we come from a bunch of different countries, I wanted to see if that, if that influenced things. All right, so it looks like we've got a number of responses. Um, unfortunately, I set it up as percentages instead of counts, so that's not entirely useful. Okay, good, so somebody did, ha somebody had never heard of these. So one of the reasons to, to learn about these things that have happened before is to understand the consequences of what happens if you do not think about ethics. And we can, we can look at these things that actually happened. And, and in some cases, they were probably well-meaning people who conducted these studies, but horrible things happened. There were horrible outcomes, and we want to avoid that at all costs in the future. So understanding that people have made mistakes in the past is helpful. It was also great in Charmaine's video, how she listed some of the mistakes that she's seen at U of A. So to say that, yes, even though we're, it's, it, we're in the 20, uh, 21st century and we've got all this ethics training and all of these, these forms you fill out and, and things you do, people still make mistakes. And we, we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. But the, big, the most important thing is just being aware understanding that mistakes can occur. Now, what, one of the things I'm personally interested in is thinking about, okay, in, in these studies, people did some horrible things, but there was still some, there, there was still science conducted. And the question is, if there is one of these bad studies, is it still ethical to use the results from that? And my, my at least according to Wikipedia, um, uh, the Japanese unit 731 um, were pardoned, were not um, uh, charged or convicted by the U.S. And in exchange for getting access to that medical data, which to my mind is pretty awful. But you could say it as this bad thing happened. Should we throw out that data or should we try to use it because it already happened? We can't change that. So I think that that could be an interesting debate to get into, which uh, hopefully will not occur at all in our class because we are only doing ethical things, so we don't need to worry about that. All right, so thank you for filling out the survey. It looks like people have been pretty aware of things, um, especially it looks like the World War II uh, was particularly large. So I was hoping that people could hop into the uh, Discord channel and see what kind of questions they had for Charmaine after, after, after having watched the video. So while, while we're waiting for um, questions in the Discord channel, 
I thought I would uh, have my slides for each. That's awesome. Uh, there we go. So what one question I had is, uh, Charmaine, is you were talking about the level of risk and benefit. So I was wondering if you could go a little more into, into what minimal risk means. So in, in the past, I, I've specifically talked about boredom and repetitive injury if they're using a keyboard. But maybe that's not necessary. But also, I'm, I'm wondering what minimal risk means in a pandemic world. So if I go to the grocery store, there is a, a non-zero chance I will get this very dangerous disease. So I was wondering if you could, could talk a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. So the Research Ethics Board uses the definition of a minimal risk that's provided in the Tri-Council Policy Statement, and that is the level of risk that an individual could expect to experience in their everyday life. So uh, from an ethics perspective, we have to weigh that against what is the experience of the potential participants. So uh, for example, um, people who are diabetic and are, are exposed, you know, have to do a, a finger prick uh, all the time. That is part of their everyday life. So being asked to participate in a study that involves that would not be of any uh, greater risk to them um, or frequent doctor visits and that sort of thing. Whereas somebody who does not uh, have diabetes, uh, somebody who doesn't have any sort of medical history, that might elevate the risk. Now, a finger prick in and of itself is, is you know, minimal risk, but like perhaps a needle or something to that effect. So things like boredom and repetitive stress in a uh, technological world that we're in today, and particularly a virtual world that we're in, um, given the pandemic, um, these are certainly risks, but are they above what would be expected in their everyday life? I think that is probably not. That is that is their most of our everyday experience for sure. Uh, yes, with respect to the pandemic, uh, these are risks that we are considering now. So when if you were to submit an ethics application uh, that proposed any sort of in-person uh, contact with your participants, first of all, you'd need all sort you'd need your dean's approval and and uh, all sorts of ancillary approvals before it got to ethics, but uh, you would need to highlight what those risks in terms of exposure to the virus are. So we do consider that an elevated risk in, this, in these times, uh, not that it's not manageable, but that you have thoughtfully uh, taken care to mitigate those risks as much as possible. So, you know, what sort of PPE are you wearing and providing to your participants? What sort of um, sanitization and physical distancing measures do you have in place? Um, as well as there are risks that might be in, related to COVID if your participants have to take public transit to come to any sort of testing session. Those need to be considered. Um, so currently the U of A uh, policy is that it, where research can be conducted can be conducted virtually, it should be. But there are uh, cases where that's not possible and the research has to go on. So you need to consider those risks. So we do say that um, COVID does present an elevated risk and we would also look at your population. So are they a vulnerable population? Are they people who are immunocompromised? We would most likely say, no, you cannot proceed with an in-person data collection because of their elevated risk and outcomes with, with COVID. But if it's a healthy population, then maybe that's all right if with the proper risk mitigation strategies. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and the it's things are definitely different these days. And I'm glad I'm glad to hear that 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 the REB is is taking that into account. That we, yeah, we need, need to have different standards. Yeah. Um, so we have, we, we do have a few questions on Discord now. Um, so one of them is in your video, you mentioned that offering too much money could be coercive. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit more about that? So for instance, uh, we just read a paper uh, by Microsoft where they were giving employees $70 an hour 
to do some, uh, to collect some data. And it sounds like they should have gotten explicit ethics approval for that higher rate, which, which they probably did. Yeah, so it is certainly proportionate to your population as well. So there's no set standard, but generally for, uh, it, it's important, researchers have expressed that it's important that we, that they be able to offer incentives to uh, increase participation in their research. And this is one of the ways that they could do that. Um, we actually do have some compensation guidelines that are available on our website as well. Um, but so for normal everyday um, tasks such as survey completion, typically where, you, where your population is of the general nature, then we typically use as a, um, a guideline, you know, uh, that current mi minimum wage rate, but it does depend on your population. So for instance, if you were going to be serving physicians who make considerably more than that an hour, and um, given their busy schedules, you could make an argument that, you know, in order to incentivize them, the rate needs to be higher. And if it's proportionate to what they would receive, then absolutely we would allow that to, to happen. So I presume that with the Microsoft employees, they have a higher rate of pay as well. And that might've been commensurate with what they would have received. Okay, that, that helps, I think. Uh, well, it helps me. Hopefully, it also <laughs> helped help the questioner uh, for that for that extra con uh, context. Another question was uh, just a general. Let's say I am a, a researcher starting out, and I know I need to do uh, ethics uh, approval. So, so for instance, in this class, we we've run a pilot study, and hey, this, this seems like it's worth investigating. So then the question is, what's a general timeline between when when you submit something? And assume assume there's no roadblocks, nobody, no no red flags are raised. What's a normal timeline for processing these? So we tell researchers to, for minimal risk studies, to build a one month timeline from the time you actually hit submit on your application till you have the approval in hand. That timeline is mitigated by many factors. Uh, one is uh, the volume of the REB at that time. So, you know, September might be a heavier month than November. Um, as well, so when we receive it, we'll send you back some change requests. So it depends how long it rests with you when you have availability to address those change requests and return them to us. The typical review process is such. Um, you hit submit, it comes to us for review. You get a preliminary review done by one of our REB specialists and they give you the the purpose of that review is to ensure that the application is in order and they will address some ethical concerns where they are common ethical concerns and so you will address that and return it um, hopefully the application is in a great place so that when it gets sent to a delegated reviewer they have very little comments and those comments are of a higher ethical uh, concern so you may get some change requests back, or it may be that they feel that the application is approvable and they will forward it to the chair who will be the final release of that approval. So it's mitigated by many things and the timeline can be far shorter uh, than that. So, but uh, comfortably you should allow yourself a month and then be pleasantly surprised if it's less. <laughs> nice. Okay, so that, that is different than my last institution where it could could take much longer than a month. Oh my goodness. Um, so Scott, I think you have an interesting question, but I'm not sure I completely understand it. Would you be willing to unmute and talk and, and ask your question directly? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious about when you collect data and appropriately, it doesn't require REB approval um, because it doesn't qualify as research for some reason or another. And then in the future, um, like you have this data, um, but you decide that you want to do something with it or change it in such a way that it would now require REB approval. Often that's in the form of publishing it as a research study or something like that. How do you go about getting um, REB approval for data that was collected already in the past? Sure. So if you are confident that the data that you accumulated your data set was 
did not require ethics review and approval to accumulate. And there are many instances where that is quite possible. Data available in the public domain, uh, data that is anonymous in nature to begin with, data that was collected under the purview of quality improvement or quality assurance. So it might have looked precisely like research, but the purpose was not research. So, you know, now you have these data sets and there's some really good data there that you think you can use to answer a research question or present in such a way that would make the, the analysis fall under the purview of research. You can return to the research ethics board and submit an application for the secondary analysis of that data. Um, these are very simple applications and I would like, seriously, they can be approved in a week or, or less actually, because the, or there are no ethical concerns once you can demonstrate that there's no possibility of identifiability within the data, it's, it's really a very um, a simple application in terms of just assessing the privacy. So yes, you can come back to the REB and say, here's, I wanna use this data secondarily. I'm, I'm wondering specifically about identifiable data that was used for QI. Okay, if you were the, did you collect it primarily? So you would, you'd be the, the custodian say of that data? Probably not. Um, the research ethics board would want to look at the reasons for which that data was collected. Uh, you are doing the right thing by coming to the REB for approval of its use because it is identifiable. I don't think that precludes that from you being able to use it, but it's certainly any um, presentations or publications that arise from that would not be with any identifiers. Am I correct? No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. I thought that that was impossible, but I, I always wondered about this particular question. Thank you. No, absolutely not. Well, and that's, that's related to something that I've run into in the past is understanding what, how do we understand the difference between asking someone to come in and test your software to see if there are bugs, see if it's usable, versus um, collecting data from a human using your software that you then go on and publish a, a human subject study on. What is there a, a, a clear difference between those two? Yes, absolutely. So it sounds like the purpose of your first um, use would be to uh, refine your program to like, the outputs from that person testing your program would be to, you know, would be put right back into the program, right? So there's no research question that you're seeking to answer there. It is merely, um, you know, quality improvement, essentially. Uh, so that would be outside of our purview and that would be fine. That doesn't mean that you still don't hold that data and let's say you wish to analyze it secondarily, you could do that as well with, with ethics approval. This, the second use you described sounds like you have specific hypothesis about what will happen with their use of that, the game or the program. Uh, so that would, that sounds more like research that would require our review and approval. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. And I think, For, I think so, that it. Yeah, when people ask, ask me, you know, is this research, does this require our REB review and approval, the first thing I ask is, what are you gonna do with the outcomes? And that tells me a lot about whether it's QI, QA, not research, or whether or not it is research. Great, that helps a lot. So I think, I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, and I'm going to paraphrase one of the questions that a student asked. Um, this is an ethics uh, uh, review. Mm -hmm. Is ethics related to morality? Because we, we would think you can argue that morality is, um, is relative, that different societies have different definitions of morality. Would, would ethics mean different things in different countries or in different contexts? Or is there a generally understood... Do you see, do you see what I'm trying to ask? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we would be um, very egotistical to think that we could um, just apply our ethical guidelines, even just even in Alberta or even in Canada, elsewhere. They're all substantially similar 
uh, across the world and they do take into account different cultures and beliefs and so from a from a ethics point of view i think um it is more prescribed in terms of you know what what we should be doing in terms of uh, ensuring that the research is being conducted appropriately um, things like morality and things that are culturally sensitive and religious beliefs are taken into consideration absolutely where, where we can understand them to the best of our ability. Ethics in and of itself ties our hands a bit in terms of what we can um, request and require of the research, but um, we do, I think we have, as humans, we have to uh, allow that leeway for that sort of morality dependent on the circumstances. I hope that helps. Um, from from a REV point of view, if we were to review research that had, was coming from another country, or even uh, a really good example is in our indigenous type of research, um, it serves us and the community and the participants well to just defer where we can um, to those communities and have them direct us in what is culturally and ethically and morally responsible for them. So. Yeah, that, that helps me a lot. Um, it's a, sorry for the kind of abstract uh, no. philosophical question. <laughs> <It's all good. laughs> getting, getting a little away from the nuts and bolts, but I think that, that was a nice answer. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Well, so Charmaine, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate that you recorded a video and talked to us. Um, as, as we get more questions, I'll, I'll try to send them to you in an e email and you can answer them when, whenever you get a chance. I, I really appreciate yeah. your time. Happy, happy to come and chat with you again if you need. So thank you very much for having me. Awesome, thank you. Take care. All right, so now I can turn things over to Dr. Mathewson. Um, so he has uh, created a Google Doc that we can uh, actually take notes in and ask, ask questions in the meeting. And I am now finding that link so that I can drop it into Discord. Uh, do, 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 copy link address. And then I'm putting this into the general channel. All right. So with that, I will stop talking um, other than to introduce Kyle saying that uh, he is a professor. He uh, runs the Attention, Perception, and Performance Lab. Uh, he is currently on sabbatical, so I am super excited that we were able to get some of his time. Because um, And he is also someone that I am looking forward to trying to collaborate with because he is doing some very awesome stuff that he'll tell us a little bit about today. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me all right? Or is this better? Is that better? It's better when you're closer. Okay. Um, so is that too loud for anyone? Is that good? So how's everyone doing? Welcome. This is my first little taste of school since being on sabbatical and teaching grade two to my kids. So it's so nice to hear someone call me Dr. Matthewson even instead of dad. <laughs> um, Okay, I think that you guys have all managed to reformat the title page pretty well by now, it looks like, on the Google Doc. So it used to look, I guess I should have made it uh, suggestions. Yeah, so may maybe people, when they open this doc in the upper right, instead of choosing editing, they could choose suggesting. Yeah, that would be nice. I'll try to do that too. Um. Yeah, that's a different way of organizing the title page, sure. I hope that you didn't organize the bottom. So what I'm going to do is, um, you can see this is just an outline. So we're going to chat about the different points that I want to bring up today. And we'll have a starting point in this graph that my brother Corey showed you last week. And think about this nebulous idea of input and feedback and also this idea of raw data and what kinds of data that could be. I'll, um, since we are recording this, not everyone will be able to see this document in the video. Would you like to share your screen or would you like yeah, me that, to share I, my screen? Yeah, that was my plan, yeah. Sorry. Oh, perfect. Um, sorry for share. jumping ahead. 
no, that was a good reminder. <laughs> um, okay, so now I should be sharing the screen. And zoom in a little bit. Okay, so man, you guys, have, is this your first Google Doc? It, it's someone's first Google Doc because they uh, so stop yeah. pressing delete. So whoever's <laughs> pressing delete. Um, there was a picture here, maybe, but anyway. So, um, what I want you to do if you're feeling like you want to edit this document, wow, all the notes are gone now too. Okay. Well, now we can't even do the presentation. So if you open this in Drive, you can go file, version history, see version history. Oh, okay, you've already got this. Okay, let's try that again. Can everyone see the updated formatted version? Yes, we can. Great, okay, so um, let's just move right to this page. So what, just a little bit about myself. I'm a native Edmontonian and I went away for school to Victoria and then to the University of Illinois and got a PhD and came back after a postdoc to start a job here at the University of Alberta. Um, my PhD is in neuroscience and psychology and my postdoc is in engineering, which isn't really an engineering. You can't, I can't be an engineer for having a postdoc in engineering. Um, but I was working at Illinois on this thing in the bottom left corner um, and some other devices like that. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But generally my work follows three kind of pillars. It's to investigate the brain and people's behavior and how they're related and to study things like attention and awareness and then to make models of how the brain might compute those things and instantiate them. And then since coming to Alberta, I've been, and even before I've been moving into this I, um, goal of making neuroimaging and just generally recording from humans behavior and, and physiology more portable. And it's not necessarily driven by some research goal that I want to understand some aspect of behavior, but I, I like tinkering with the gadgets. And so we're kind of doing basic science of how to make these devices more portable and test their use out in the world. So we've been doing EEG on bikes. And another aspect of this research is miniature computers like Raspberry Pis and these latte pandas which run windows and so we can use those to collect data as well we can present different stimuli to people with them we can use them to record the data and we can also use them to um, record responses like we can put buttons on the handlebars of the bicycle and so I, can i interrupt with an abstract question please um so i know i know a bunch of people are working in wearable computing um is this do you see this as just kind of a natural progression that we've been doing over the years? Or do you think there's going, there has been, or there's going to be a kind of a phase change where we're able to, to do completely new things and it's not just an incremental improvement? Yeah, good question. Um, one of the companies I work with is this new company called Blueberry that's making these um, brain sensing glasses. And one of their co-founders is Steve Mann who has been since the 1980s wearing computers on his body. And this used to be way harder. I'll show you. Oops. Um, so you can see in these old pictures, his imagination was way ahead of the technology. He would have to wear these giant contraptions You can see him and his friends from U of T in 1999 here. Um, and so you can imagine that it is a qu quantitative improvement that's got us to this position where we can um, both cheaply manufacture these devices and flexibly prototype them. And also we can shrink down the compute and have new materials as well. So those I think are all quantitative but that maybe the qualitative shift i think 
in my mind comes from the middle ground. And maybe you can tell that both my brother and I are trying to kind of get into that middle area in between the human and the computer. Cause it's just putting the thing on one human in 1999 didn't really solve the problem of why everyone would want to wear a headband that was recording everything they did. But good question. And yeah, I think there are some qua qualitative differences in materials as well. Like this is, um, printable, flexible electronics. And so that's, I think that this is a qualitative difference. If you can create electronics that have the same mechanical properties as skin, then wearable computers is, is um, you're solving a lot of the main conformity problems between the machine and the human. Um, so yeah, I've been working with a number of companies and in my lab to miniaturize the tech. So here's like um, an optical imaging machine that we just got at University of Alberta before the lockdown as well. So I have a $300,000 rack of lasers and detectors that um, we can't even go touch. And I kind of want to take it to my garage. Um, but as you can see behind me here, I have all my EEG equipment now at my house. So I'm going to start grade two EEG class soon. Um, so we're trying to miniaturize this down from this form factor where it's in a research lab to the place where the same technology can be pushed into a small device on glasses. So this is a one or two channels of lasers and detectors on the side of glasses. I work with companies like this Canadian company Interaxon and I just um, created a, a portable research lab at the University of Alberta that probably the computing science students are going to use as well. So we have 50 headsets and we've made a web app that you can use to learn in real time with these devices um, using your own data from your brain. That's a class I teach. Oh, I guess you guys are all grad students. So by the time I teach it again, it'll be too late. Um, but you can go to, uh, yeah, I guess I should be writing in this document sometimes, right? That's eegedu.com or it's GitHub, Kyle Math, eegedu. Um, this is another company, even smaller form factor, little earbuds, they're called Orbital. So I'm, I'm starting to get involved in industry in this way and the role I'm playing is is a weird kind of middle ground role and it's exactly the the purpose of the discussion today so last week i think corey um i think came up with this graph that he showed you and he showed how the raw data can become processed to create this kind of ai models that you would design the architecture of and you get input from humans as you design that and you create these predictions and the humans act on them. And I think this was a very general overview. When I was first hearing about Matt's class, I was picturing a more kind of live and interactive human in the loop AI when I was picturing what to talk about today, which is also what Corey does. So I was surprised at how general his overview was. Um, but the basic idea that I want to talk about today is if, if any of you have seen my brother's shows and he has this AI that's creating jokes, tells the jokes, the audience laughs sometimes. And my idea would be to like how to take those laughs and feed them back into the model to train the model to improve its jokes. And I, I'm, I don't think the research is quite there yet. And, but that's kind of a, that's a, a tractable problem. So today I want to talk about what, besides that laughter, what other learning model, learning cues or signals can humans give off that AI could use. And then also I think this will give you a sense of the raw data sets that you see of human data out there, how they're collected and, and what they mean. When I start to consult for these companies, they, this is their goal. It's these latent variables of interest. They want to know how much of these nine or 10 or 11 things, if you can think of any other things that you as a startup founder would want to measure, put them on this list as well. Like I get a call and they say, Hey, we, we have this device and it attaches to the brain and we measure the electrical activity of the brain. And we want to know if people are engaged. 
That's the basic problem. And so you, the difficulty is the latent nature of these qualities. We don't know. Yeah, happiness is a good one as well. That we don't know in the brain or in the heart rate or in the sweating what conclusively indicates one is happy. Our best evidence that someone is happy when it's ourself is that we feel happy. And when it's someone else, we say, hey, how are you doing? And they say, I am happy now. And as much as we have all this crazy technology, that's still the best way to find out if they're happy or not. And so most of the research I do is trying to link these 10 items with physiology and behavior and to find correlations and then to create models of those links and then test those models to create more and more evidence that when the brain instantiates attention, for instance, when we improve the processing of some things and ignore other things, this is the mechanism in the brain by which that happens. This circuit gets boosted and this circuit gets diminished. And our measurement of the brain is so coarse and our measurement of behavior is even coarser because we're just measuring the output of the system that these 10 and more latent variables of interest are nebulous. They're hard to grab. And all of these are the holy grail right now of Silicon Valley. If you could measure fatigue, you could make a fatigue monitor and sell it to every truck driver in America. If you could measure energy, you could sell it to every coach and teacher in America. And so I, when I teach in my psychology classes, I try to emphasize that the, the missing link of a lot of these companies is this middle ground between kind of psychology and computing science and data science, how to link the psychology, the feelings that we have that we want to capture and monitor better, like when we're happy, when we're frustrated. If I could have a hat that showed my kids when I was frustrated, they would know immediately when not to talk, when not to like walk into my office. And that seems like an easy problem. That's my field. That's what I do. And I, I guess I could use my heart rate and all these different things. But in the end, these things, these links between the observable, measurable aspects of ourselves and the latent underlying things like happiness and emotion are the missing link. So I won't tell you the answers to the, how, to, how to measure any of these things, but we can think about it. So if, if you have one of these that you want some ideas about how to measure, preference is an easy one. I think preference is one that is agreed upon of how we would measure preference. We would ask people Coke or Pepsi and they would pick it and we would assume that that decision actually represented their underlying preference. So what we can measure, however, is all sorts of aspects of people's behavior in the world, the output of their sensory motor system, right? We're all sensors in the world that take in the sights and sounds and feelings and compute that information and turn it into actionable movements of our muscles and thoughts. We can't measure the thoughts, but we can measure any overt movement of a muscle and we can also measure even like aspects of our physiology that are not conscious, which I'll talk about on the next page. So a lot of these are very um, common. And so you've seen them all before and, and you've done these sorts of tests. We can ask people to press a button. We can measure how fast or how accurate or how long it takes them. We can measure how variable those responses are. You've all done tests in class and there's a whole field of how to construct tests to measure things. And so one technique psychologists use to measure something like um, attention or engagement or emotion or intelligence is by creating large banks of tests and then doing unsupervised learning on the answers to create clusters of, resp of correlated responses to the questions. This is called like a test theory. And then you can try to assign to those clusters some latent underlying properties. And so that's how intelligence tests works. 
um, maybe more relevant for people doing kind of human in the loop AI or these things like hand tracking or body tracking or touch screen responses. And then maybe for Corey's is like a vocal or, or auditory responses. You can ask people just to kind of talk about how they're feeling or what their thoughts were. And of course, people measure from humans often by measuring their um, consumer choices. But we don't just have one person often, we can have whole groups of people or whole countries of people or whole nations of people. In a group of people, you could measure every aspect of their conversation. So we've done studies of cell phones in driving simulators and we record the dyadic conversation and we transcribe it into text. And then we could measure when the person you're talking on the phone to is talking about traffic. And we find that if the person you're talking on the phone to has a video feed of your driving, they talk about, obviously talk about traffic more. They warn you when you're about to hit stuff. And, and we, we were able to, um, show that you could mitigate some of the distracting effects of driving by giving the conversation partner like a live, I, I figured this out actually talking to Corey on Skype like 10 years ago while I was driving and I was very distracted. And I said, here, you just look at the road and then you can help me to, to warn me if something's gonna happen. Um, so you're right, we could measure all of someone's conversation. We could transcribe it. We could measure how much they look at each other, how much maybe a mom and her kids touch each other as they're interacting. And also there's many nonverbal cues like body language or where the arms are doing and where someone's looking and how their hands are. And in many other cultures, um, like my wife's Italian family, the hand movements uh, say a lot about the underlying communicative goals. We don't have to stop there. We can measure from whole crowds of people. And so this is where things get interesting. This is where things might be easier in a time like COVID as well. I can set up a camera just facing out my window here and do experiments on people. Just I could just film. I have a doorbell that films all the time and I can measure every car that goes by and I can estimate its speed. Or I could count the number of people flowing by. So I've seen really interesting work looking at the movement of crowds or large groups of people. Um, but then you can think that a lot of um, the online data that's out there right now is this kind of data as well. Customer reviews on Amazon or trading volume of different stocks or um, also the, the networks of how people interact online. So I wanted to show you this kind of various levels of scale. And we're gonna even zoom in further on the next slide. So you can see how you could just ask someone how they're feeling. You can give them a little survey or say on a scale from one to 10, are you happy? And most of the companies that I work with are in this kind of area that they're, they're asking people if they're paying attention now and now and now and now, and they're trying to correlate those measures with their underlying physiology. But when I see a stimulus, like say I'm in the grocery store and I see two snacks and I reach, I haven't been to the grocery store in six months. So this would be like an amazing experience if I could do it right now. And I could just like sit there and look at the two options and just pick one. And in between that visual recognition of the items, in between the, the things hitting my retina, and me reaching out, maybe it's like uh, two seconds or one second. And without measuring anything besides my behavior, like reach it, which one I touch, we're missing out on a lot of the underlying computations that likely happen inside of the body in between those two times, in between when you see something and when you move, there's all these processing that's going on. And so by measuring from the brain and the body in between those two times, we can essentially measure like um, parts of the computation, parts of the algorithmic processes that lead from the stimulus to the response. 
So physiology in, in my eyes, I guess, and in many people's that are kind of engineering focused seems like a more objective truth that I know that when someone asks me how I'm doing, my answer isn't true. It's I'm not saying how I'm doing. I'm saying like, ah, some word that I kind of wanted them to hear and that they, they're happy. And like, I'm not, if I'm not doing that well, but they're sensitive, I'm not going to tell them that. And so if you could better link physiology to those underlying latent factors, then you would be closer to the things that we're actually interested in. And they'd be less sensitive to other biases that we might have in certain ways because we're worried about making the other person feel weird or how we'll look or essentially, which makes them dangerous as well. I know that Corey brought up a little bit about ethics uh, in his slides and you guys just talked to in a, in a different way to the ethics um, office about what kind of studies you can do and how you have to get uh, permission to do those things. But obviously if we have less control over people reading these things from us and making imp making decisions based off of them they become a little bit more dangerous like if i ask you were you in calgary yesterday and you say no you have a guard against me but if i'm at the same time i'm filming you with a webcam and measuring your heart rate and i see that your heart rate doubled when you said no then that gives away something about you that you didn't want to give away. And not to say that that is a great measure of whether you're lying or not. We can talk about that. So yeah, let's put that up here too, that like uh, one of the underlying latent factors that we're interested in is um, truthfulness. That's the one that's probably been most common in law enforcement, for instance, to use lie detectors. So. These are things that should remind you of lie detectors, these physiology measurements. So these are some things that you can measure and that I have the equipment right here to measure from my kids. Like if they say, I didn't steal a cookie, I can sit them down and try to figure out who stole the cookie. I have no confidence that I could figure out who of my two kids stole a cookie using this technique. But I could measure their sweating. So this is called a galvanic skin response. And it's essentially measuring the, the resistance of your skin. Mine's getting pretty clammy right now but from being on stage for the first time in six months. And so um, right now, the electricity would pass more easily through my skin and I could measure that over time. And that's one of the things that the old lie detectors would measure. You can measure respiration. You could measure respiration from the audio feed of a Zoom call, as you probably have heard from loud breathing colleagues. And you could measure respiration from video. So you could film my chest right now and you could move, these lines would move slightly each breath. But you can usually, like if you were doing it at the gym or something, you would get a, um, a belt that would change its resistance as it stretched out and you could measure that signal. Heart rate is an interesting and very, I think heart rate is the closest to, we have the best trust over what changes in heart rate mean. We know for instance, that when we get stressed out, our heart rate increases. And we know for sure that when we exercise, our heart rate increases. You can measure heart rate using electricity by putting two electrodes across the heart. And so um, what's an example of that? Oh, like the exercise bikes at the gym, they have two metal pads across your heart and then they can very easily measure your heart rate. You can use a pulse oximeter, um, which is something that clamps on your finger at the hospital and it measures changes in the absorption of light. Let me get one. So don't here use is a, don't a, you use a pulse um, oximeter for sorry, uh, Matt? don't you use a pulse oximeter to measure oxygen and that's one of the things you can use for COVID? Yeah, exactly. Great. Oh, I have that somewhere too in my COVID kit. Um 
That'd be a crazy YouTube video of just someone looking for stuff in their workshop. Um, the, yeah, so you can, you can um, one warning sign of COVID that happens earlier to the symptoms sometimes is a decrease in the oxygenation of your blood as your lungs start to get filled with this mucus. And so um, in the early days of COVID, that was one of the ways that they were triaging at hospitals was by um, people with low oxygenation. And if there's one thing that you might buy at home to early check yourself, that probably would be one of the ones that you would buy. I think they're very cheap in, on Amazon now because of that. Um, this is one that fits on the side of your head. So this is a prototype of, from this blueberry company. Um, and it's just a small chip and a battery in this 3D printed case, but you can see it has like a two, it has three light sources and two detectors. So and it measures the oxygenation of your blood because uh, oxygenated blood is differentially absorbed by light than non-oxygenated blood. So you can like uh, measure oxygenation. So the idea of this company is if you could um, measure blood oxygenation at all times, then you can have some indication of people's mental state. A really cool one, yeah, let's bring up this paper, is that you can use um, you can use a webcam to do some of these things. And it's cool and scary. Um, trying to find the paper. Here it is. Maybe. Oh, here. So um, the, the light coming off of my fancy light here in the sun comes in. It doesn't just hit my skin. It goes into my skin. Some of it gets absorbed by blood and comes back out. And so you may have seen from MIT about a decade ago, they had a mirror set up that could tell you your heart rate. And they were using this um, a technique where you use a webcam and you pull out from an area of interest in the face, just the red, green, and blue values over time. And so you could imagine like a Zoom client like this that had a little icon for every participant in the Zoom call that had their heart rate and their respiration. And I wouldn't be surprised if you have an infrared camera, you can do this even easier. I wouldn't be surprised if there, there is certainly security areas in the world that are using this kind of thing as a measurement of people's and trying to understand people that have elevated heart rate in situations where they shouldn't. Not to scare you or anything. Um, but just imagine talking to your spouse on webcam and seeing their heart rate. There's, real, there's cool videos called Ur Urulean video magnification. Urulean video magnification. And um, they accentuate the physiological features of the signal and then recreate the video. So you can have like a baby monitor where you can see the baby's heart rate. Where's my paste? Um, here. Okay. Um, yeah, head tracking and eye tracking is another kind of useful metric. Um, of course, eye tracking is really relevant for this latent measure of attention. We assume that where people are looking is often where they're attending. And so you can get an eye tracker um, built into a webcam or you can get a head mounted eye tracker. So here's another kind of glasses mounted system that has an outward facing camera and has an inward facing camera that films your pupil. And so it measures um, movements of your pupil and also measures reflection of infrared light and can triangulate the um, location you're looking and overlay it onto a, a video feed. Um, I think that's company called Pupil Labs, but this is pretty cheap. This is like a 3D printed um, 
glasses and then a bunch of relatively cheap parts. So you can make most of these things if you're willing to do it yourself for a couple hundred or, or under a thousand dollars. Like that's money that's in the range of things you can ask your advisors for. Um, eye tracking is a big one as well. And yeah, so we, I just made for an artist, like, um, an installation that was online where you have, it tracks where you're looking and it plays certain audio depending on where you're looking and how close you are to the webcam. So it's like an interactive audio experience based off just the human's face as the input measure. And, um, it also, whenever you start to smile, it modulates the types of sounds that it's playing you. So it also is kind of detecting your emotion. You could picture this thing measuring your heart rate and those kind of things too. Okay, we're close to the brain stuff. Um, yeah, oh, facial expressions is a big one too. So that I just mentioned that, but there's lots of really interesting. Um, I can show you this. Let me try to find my interactive art thing. Um, and then I'll share this code. May I jump in for an eye tracker? Yeah. Uh, it's a company named that Toby. Yep. There are a really good eye trackers as I've been a, a teacher assistant in, in my class. We just tested some eye trackers, but uh, I found that it was really interesting and was really accurate. And it doesn't need anything on above your head. It just uh, something in, in front of the monitor and just uh, track your eyes. Uh, I think it was really good, and but it was a little bit uh, expensive. It was about 1500, but I think it was worth. <laughs> Yeah, one second here, let me... Uh... Yeah, so Toby sells um, like a gaming version as well. This one I think is only 400 or 300. And again, it, it just attaches right up to the bezel of your monitor. And it won't be as good as the one you tried that's integrated into the monitor, but you can get, it's really captivating to see someone's eyes being tracked um, you can watch YouTube videos. I think there's like a YouTube meme where like uh, spouses make their sp significant other watch videos and then with an eye tracker on and then they watch what they're looking at in the video. Um, yeah, so I just posted in here like a um, P5JS sketch. If you've never tried P5JS, it's a really nice kind of um, visually interactive based programming language in the browser. And this sketch interacts with the webcam and also has an emotion tracker here as well. So you could try out some of those things if you like. You can save a version and start to edit it. You can do all those things locally as well. You don't have to use their online editor. And they integrate really well into web page. Um, yeah, human gaze assisted artificial intelligence. So I think gaze is a really interesting one because of how rich the data set is. And so if you have like um, an image classifier, for instance, that's trying to learn maybe like a transformer model that's trying to learn some attention about the different images you might be able to seed it with these kind of eye tracking data. This is really, I guess, similar to the work Alana's doing lately of trying to use human input to train models a little bit better. Um, GPS location, but even location within a room. So in rat research, you can just track where a rat goes all about a room, but you could do that with kindergarten kids in a classroom or with your kids outside on the street or with soccer players in a soccer field. You could track where people are in a building and how they're interacting or we all have GPS um, trackers um, that we're feeding our data into some companies that are using it for things that we don't even know about. Um, 
And then biorhythms is kind of like a meta measurement. If you're measuring these things repeatedly over time, you'll find that humans have rhythmic cycles of, of our behaviors and physiology. So you can measure things like sleep over time and the depth of sleep and when people eat. Um, let's just put that right here. So any um, other questions about those ones or how or where there's, um, really nice like GitHub repos to measure a lot of these things with a webcam while people are at home. A lot of my colleagues in psychology are also implementing a lot of their experiments online as well now. And being able to link those two is really important. If you can do an experiment at someone at home, a memory task where you're also measuring their eye movements the whole time and their heart rate from a webcam, then you almost have as much information as if they were in your lab. Okay, so finally, maybe we want to measure the actual computation itself. So all of these physiological measures are kind of downstream effects of the computation. When I get stressed, my body sends a signal to my, my brain sends a signal to my body to increase my heart rate and perspiration. And so that also is just an echo of that signal in my brain that I'm stressed. And so if we could actually measure that network of activity in the brain that's associated with stress, we could better understand when it's active and when it's not. We could try to fix it when it goes awry. We could make new ones for people that there's breaks. And we could make better computations. Maybe we don't want to be stressed whenever we have to speak in front of people. So the four, I guess, main non-invasive neuroimaging techniques are listed here. I can write out the, oh, I didn't mention electromyogram. So this is like muscle activity. And electromyogram, you can measure even of the face. So it's one thing Corey could do with his audience is put little um, electrodes on their smile muscles. And then he could measure whenever they're smiling and feed that into his models. But I think the laughter with the audio is a better strategy. Um, or you could film all their facial expressions. And when they smile, you could use that as learning signals. Um, Electromyogram. Oh, I forgot one thing that many of you probably on your watch have a heart rate monitor as well. So like th these are now in the last 10 years have become ubiquitous and it's doing the same thing. It's shining light and has a detector and it's measuring the absorption of the light. And it's crazy that we all have these, but we don't have access to the raw data. If you can't like set up a web socket of your heart rate and send it into your phone and use it yourself but you, you're happy to wear this device. So EEG. So um, EEG is what I do a lot of in my lab. It's measuring the electrical activity of the brain. So just like we can measure electrical activity from muscles or from the eyes or from the uh, heart, we can also measure the faint electrical signals that occur from our brain and they travel through volume conduction through the brain and all the way up to our scalp and skull. And we can stick electrodes on our head and we can measure those signals. Let me get a... So these um, consumer devices you can buy at Best Buy. This is from the company Interaxon. And this is like the most popular EEG system in the world. They've sold more of this than any research-based EEG company, which means it's like a giant trove of data. They have more data than any EEG researcher has ever managed to get. And that's, that's the exciting thing for me. I'm realizing that the scale of research that needs to be done to connect those latent underlying goals with these kind of measures needs to be at big data scales. And so one researcher can't do it in his lab. So I'm perfectly happy 
shutting my lab at the university down because I know that the real data sets are out in people's homes. So um, EEG can measure a couple things from the brain. It can measure, um, like if you throw a rock into a river over and over again and you filmed it, even if the river was kind of wavy, if you averaged all of those repeated filmings, all of those random waves would disappear and you would only see the ripples of the rock. So one technique we can do is show person a repeated event over and over and over again and average all the other electrical noise out to get what's called an evoked potential. If you've had a kid, this has happened to your baby at the hospital on the first couple of days of their life, they stuck some of these things on their head, they played them a bunch of sounds and they measured their brain's response to those sounds to try to understand if any of their auditory processing pathways were, um, were impacted by some developmental problem and they could start to um, implement some therapy that early. You can also, also measure the oscillations in the brain. So our brain, you probably heard of alpha waves. So our brain in its basic states has certain frequencies that it responds at, just like your processor in your computer, they're just much, much slower and they're uh, heterogeneous. So across different brain areas and within a brain area over time, the different parts of the network are oscillatory. So we can measure those oscillations and we can try to link them to different things. Like for instance, in my research, I've been showing that when we are ignoring things in the world, we boost our alpha oscillations, these oscillations that happen 10 times a second. And I think that that's the mechanism by which the brain instantiates attention. When I need to attend to one thing and ignore another thing, I increase these alpha waves in the circuits that I'm trying to ignore, decreasing their relevance for my information processing. And people also measure resting state EEG. So you can just measure kind of the, the resting state frequency activity of the brain and see how it changes over time. MEG measures the same kind of signals, but it measures the um, orthogonal magnetic signal to the electric field. So the electric fields are going like this and the magnetic fields are going like that. You'll remember from physics 20 or whatever. And those magnetic signals are um, less impacted by the skull. So they're a little stronger, but the equipment is quite expensive because you need to super cool magnets. But this, I think this is the new frontier of, of brain recording because now there is, um, what is it called? Portable MEG. Yeah, this person with the mask. Okay, so um, now we have this um, MEGs that don't have to fit in this giant case anymore. They can have this portable nature where you just have to walk around looking like Hannibal Lecter and then you can measure the electrical activity of your brain. Okay, fMRI, maybe you've heard of the most. I think that the the person in your department that works with brains the most studies fMRI. Russ Grainer um, work is a lot in fMRI. Um, fMRI is a measure of the blood flow in the brain that's created using a giant magnetic field and jiggling all the protons in our brain with a little bit of radio energy. As they're in this giant magnetic field, they're all like, all these protons are spinning around in this magnetic field and you shoot them with a little energy and some of them flip and then they turn back the other way and you can measure that electrical signal they create as they change their energy from changing configuration. Someone won the Nobel Prize for this discovery and now we can use this to measure blood flow because the blood, it sends, um, when you have an area with a lot of blood, this takes a little bit longer to flip back because there's more protons in the area. So there's a signal that's sensitive to the amount of blood in a certain area. So you stick someone in this big scanner and you can show them a bunch of pictures and you can measure their blood flow in different parts of their brain. So in most pictures you might have seen in the media where they say this brain area is involved in this or this brain area is active in this case, 
it's in these kind of fMRI studies where they'll um, have someone imagine this or imagine that and show where the blood flows. The blood flow takes six to 10 seconds after the neurons fire. So th think about that, like in terms of a neural network and what the signal would look like in a neural network. So you'd, you'd run a picture through your neural network to get a classification of a dog or a cat, and it would run through in a fraction of a millisecond. And then like 10 seconds later, a bunch of blood would like flow into those regions of the computer that were processing the dog versus the cat. And so maybe you could measure that fluid with some sort of like magnets or something in your neural network. If, if you haven't seen, you should look up people making like steampunk real life neural networks where each of the units is like a real valve with water in it. And they're trying to connect like hundreds and hundreds of these valves together. Because then you could picture an fMRI signal coming from that. But yeah, so it's delayed. And so if, if you're trying to use it as a control signal or as a feedback signal, it, it has some problems. And that also affects this um, FNIR. So FNIRs is an oximeter on your head. And so this is what this Blueberry company is working on, putting an oximeter right up against your head and measuring the blood that your brain absorbs differentially over time. And this is also um, the equipment that we got in my lab. So we got a giant system that has like uh, 60 lasers and 40 detectors that measures from all the lasers. So you can make maps of people's brain activity. What about, yeah, I haven't even mentioned anything that Neuralink's doing. So that the, the fifth option here would be to like cut someone open and stick stuff inside them right and no one wants that but elon musk is kind of banking on the fact that we'll slowly open up to the possibility that we might want that i guess people get like um lasik surgery like people treat lasik surgery pretty nonchalantly these days and the first person to do it they must have been like really you're planning on shining a laser into your eye to cut part of your cornea yeah i'm gonna do it so i think that over time it might become more normal to want to implant something in your body I, there's a lot of biohackers that do that as well um, but there's lots of people that need to get things implanted in their brains because they have epilepsy and they need to monitor the location of that epileptic seizure and so there's a lot of data sets out there of intracranial recording. So recording from inside people's brains. And so that's the first people that will get neural links that instead of um, the old technology being implanted into them, this new tech that's wirelessly charged and wirelessly transmits the data and has a thousand different sensors in a smaller form factor will, will be implanted using those kind of machines that he is demonstrating. What else? So it's kind of, um, I hope you realize that we're only like, the EEG was discovered in 1929. Actually, it was like 1925, I think. And the guy who discovered it was too nervous to tell anyone because he didn't think anyone would believe him because he was studying EEG because he was looking for evidence of telepathy. He, he had fallen off a horse. This is guy's name is Hans Berger. And he'd fallen off a horse in the war. And at the same time he fell off the horse, his sister, a thousand kilometers away, had had a premonition that something was wrong. And so he then, like after the war, set up a secret lab at the University of Vienna um, where his colleagues couldn't see what he was doing and started sticking wires like into his children's scalp. They had already known that if you opened up a cat and you measured from its brain, you could see the activity of the brain electrically, but no one thought that it could be possible through the scalp. So we're not even a hundred year, years in of non-invasive measurement of the brain. And these four techniques are like fMRI was like uh, 1970 or something. 
and Emmy G's in the 1950s. And F Nears is like just when the, the photograph started not being black and white. So I hope you realize that it's the infancy of these techniques and that um, I, I don't think when we learn them in our textbooks that we think about them as kind of how new they are. And it, this isn't like um, heart measurement where you, a doctor for thousands of years could measure the activity of your heart with a finger on your throat that um, there's probably going to be newer techniques soon. I didn't mention some of the techniques for stimulating the brain because that's maybe a different, different goal. But you could imagine part of a human in the loop AI might give feedback to the user. And some of that feedback may even try to bypass the user and go right to their brain. And so you might have feedback that instead of saying like, you are getting tired, it just stimulates some part of your brain and makes you less tired. And then you take the human out of that. You take the conscious human out of that loop. So if you have any questions, let me know. If um, I think the last thing I wanted to talk about was an even harder problem. And it's what I would maybe call like super latent variables of interest. And these are maybe relevant to some of the models of AI that are being developed of, of um, how an agent can learn or how an agent can act in a world. So knowing someone's emotions and knowing their feelings and knowing their attention and knowing their stress still leaves me missing something about why they're acting and why in this situation they act this way and why in this situation they act this way. As a parent, these are really relevant things and it, you can see them like slipping through your hands, like why is he acting like that? Or like what, and you get a really good sense of what's motivating your kid to do this or motivating your kid to do that. As a scientist, we have very little um, ideas about how to measure these kind of things that are kind of underlying, underlying things. Uh, one that I thought of, with respect to Matt's research is like your policy, your, your link between your, um, how do you define a policy? It's like the link between your stimulus and your response. And so in a different situation, someone, as we said before, if I say, how are you doing? And, and 10 different people in 10 different situations ask me, how am I doing? And I respond in five different ways. It seems like I have different policies for acting in those different situations. And so just understanding the latent feeling of how I'm doing and how my words map onto that is missing even this information about how my responses depend on the situation. So, uh, a big, oh yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, sorry, so we've got about two minutes left, but I, I did wanna ask you one question. Um, at least one. Uh, you, you mentioned a number of companies that you, you have worked with or are working with. Are you doing that because they have cool hardware or do they have really interesting algorithms or is it some combination? Yeah, it's the hardware mostly that the, the reason I've been working with this company is because up until I started working with Interaxon, I needed to spend 20 grand for an EEG system. And so doing it with a whole classroom is unfeasible. Now that they're selling them to consumers for $200, it means they're, they're manufacturing them for 70 or 30 or $20. And so this, it's just like a crazy change in the scale of these hardware products. But I think along with that change in the scale and the cost, the corollary of that is users, that now this is big data. Once this is, they've managed to sell this as a meditation device to some hundreds of thousands of people. And so I think it's more like 40,000 people. It's not hundreds of thousands. And now this is a data set bigger than any other data set of EEG in the world. And that's kind of the, and the value that I'm bringing to the company is in the data analytics and the algorithmic development, I think trying to link up the latent things that they're interested in, that the consumer and the investor are interested in with these observable objective physiological and behavioral measures. 
Very cool. That helps me. That makes sense. Um, and I think one of the nice things your lecture has done has really emphasized how many different things we can collect. So I, I'm particularly interested in learning more about what we can collect from a webcam, because mm -hmm. that's that software we all have. Uh, we can do experiments remotely, and you know I, I'm very interested in eye gaze. But then we would need to get that hardware to the uh, human subjects. Right. Whereas if we can measure things through just a webcam, that that would be amazing. Yeah, I saw there's a JavaScript. Um, toolbox for I think I gazer.js or something like that yeah web gazer.js I'll paste it in I'm not sharing my screen I realize now um I'll paste it into the document and this is like a toolbox for interacting with eye movements over webcam that someone must have made some breakthrough on I I had something in grad school which now is 10 years ago that I used for about two months, which was a webcam based eye tracker. Um, and it worked. It, I was using it as an input device on my laptop for a couple of weeks or months. And um, I think like it, they stopped supporting it and it wasn't working anymore. But I think that's a, a really interesting um, tool that we can deploy all over the world now. Very cool imagine i could you could see which of you i was looking at at any given time that would that would be cool i, f I find myself pointing in zoom meetings yeah, you... which does no one <laughs> any good right everyone's in a different place any um, other question so there there's one other question in discord where uh, someone was asking how dependent are these methods on the particular camera because you know there are so many different kinds of webcams, it seems like some would be better or worse, or maybe some wouldn't work at all. Yeah, I um, most MacBook cameras work pretty well, and these Logitech cameras work really well. The phone, I think that most cameras are pretty good. There are some really clunky webcams and even inbuilt webcams. I think that, yeah, one dangerous thing is on iPhones and on a lot of web Mac cameras, there's like, um, they do a lot of normalization. They, they do post-processing of the feed. And so some of the physiological signals like your heartbeat might get taken out of data like that. We were having trouble filming with an iPhone um, when we, before we realized that, uh, there was a lot of post-processing going on then we had to use like a dslr camera instead um yeah i think so i think that that's part of like the messiness of the real world that we would have to deal with yeah definitely and if you're trying to measure heart rate and you can't find the heart rate it's easy to exclude that data if you yeah. measure a heart rate that's incorrect because of the camera that could be that could be harder yeah, like, a, yeah, no measurements better than noisy measurement. I guess that's another thing I try to help these companies with that I'm working with that they're, they're like bad data is worse than no data. Awesome. So I think uh, to be respectful of people's time, I'm going to cut things off here. But as normal, I am more than happy to, to stick around and hang out for a little while to answer questions or just talk.